I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is the General Government Committee meeting, uh, May 4th, 2022. Uh, the time is 5 p.m. And may we have a roll call, please. Councilmember Dennehy. Here. Councilmember Schmisher. Here. Councilmember B. Smith. Here. Councilmember Stein. Here. Councilmember Tracy. Here. Count, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Hamrick. Here. Mayor Smith. Here. And we have two agenda items tonight. Um, and I do have a request to speak, uh, and we will get to that, about wildlife, um, which is our first agenda item, and also fence requirements in residential areas. Our second item, we also have another request, and we will get to that also. Um, and so with that, i turn it over to you guys, I guess, and glad. make sure you use your... Uh, your microphones and your, the light's green. All right, thank you for having us. You gotta push the green button. There, there we go. All right, we're good. Hot mic. Thank you. All right. Thank you, thank you for having us. My name's Bob Croce. I'm a game warden with uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, <clears throat> my district basically takes everything north of the Arkansas from Pueblo County <clears throat> to Cotopaxi, north towards Hartzell, then back over towards Skagway Reservoir and Highway 115. So part of what we're gonna speak about tonight deals with uh, the, what, what is known as the in-town deer hunt. And so part of it is in my district and the other part is in my partner, Zach Holder's district. And hi guys, my name is Zach Holder. I'm the district wildlife manager in the Canyon City South District. So um, I cover everything from the Pueblo County line to Hayden Creek and then uh, south of the Arkansas River to the Fremont County line basically. So. Um, Bob and I are the two wildlife officers that uh, cover Canyon City. Um, back in 2017 and start of 2018, um, we were approached by the, by the city because of some con concerns about the, the increasing deer population in and around the city limits. And, uh, one of the tools that we use for for management is is hunting. That's how we you know keep control of of some of our our population numbers. And so it was was talked about, and the decision was made that we would um, put in a hunt code in our brochure that would allow hunting in in city limits. So there was some discussion about what would be legal, what wouldn't be legal. Um, there's no discharge of a firearm, obviously allowed, and so. The license has to be used as an archery license, so, um, but it does take in some of the unit does take in part of the county where firearms can be discharged, and so the license was decided to be a, a rifle license. But while it was in city limits, it had archery equipment had to be used. With that being said, since it was a rifle license, they would have to abide by the same rules and regulations that a rifle hunter had. So wearing daylight fluorescent orange during legal hunting hours. All of that would have to be um, followed. Sorry. So um, in 2019 is when we started the, the actual first hunt. There were 75 licenses that were available through our draw system. Um, we had close to 135, 140 people apply for those 75 licenses. And from there, um, we had close to 15 animals harvested with that, is that correct? Yeah, we 15 animals harvested. With those, with those 75 licenses for that season. The following two years, we've seen very consistent numbers with the number of people that have applied for the license that receive it, and then also the percent or the number of animals harvested with it. Um, the success rate for somebody that, that draws a license, it's right around 35 to 45% success for that, which is relatively high for an archery license for, for a mule deer, but then also taking into some of the circumstances of 
just the location, the number of deer, and also the proximity where they're they're hunting. It's not like they're they're hunting out in the middle of you know the Grand National Forest or something like that. So it's kind of limited, or they know where the deer are going to be, and so that um, helps increase that. We've had a number of questions about if we've had any um, issues with it as far as law enforcement, you know, people doing things incorrectly. Actually, in town, the the hunters that were in town, I don't know right off the top of my head that we've had any calls or complaints with, with uh, folks that have been hunting in city limits. The two issues that I know of took place outside of the city limits. Somebody had the license and they were unsure of where the actual boundary where the actual boundary was and so they were hunting outside the established unit for that so further out of town up by Teller County and stuff where that license isn't valid and those were the the two issues that we had there they did kill deer but those deer um, weren't legal because that license wasn't valid where they killed it but as far as you know speaking to some of the hunters in and around town and also the residents of the city I don't I know that I haven't had any um, calls for complaints or, or concerns about it. It's actually the first year that we did it, um, both Zach and I wanted to make sure that we were around when it first opened up in case we had had issues and stuff. And after last year, it was one of the seasons that we knew it was going on, but you know, had um, very little time of ours were, was involved with it. Anything uh, to add with that? Yeah, I, I think, from my standpoint, I, I take in the Lincoln Park area, you know, so um, we've got a lot of those larger hay fields, we've got orchards and things like that. And, and I just want to reiterate what Bob says, I, I have not had any problems um, that stem from this in town deer hunt. Uh, when we do have an issue where an animal goes on to a different piece of property that where a, a hunter doesn't have permission to hunt, they've been really good about calling us to let us help them through that process, contacting neighbors. I have not had any negative responses from um, landowners in those areas. And, and to the contrary, I, I've actually had people um, that have started calling me and saying, Zach, when you have this season and you have people that need a place to hunt, please have them contact me so that I can get them in there and, and try and get some harvest. Um, one other thing that I wanted to, to talk about is uh, the success rate, you would think it's pretty easy. You got 75 licenses. We only had 15 deer killed. It's not, it's not something that's very difficult. We know those deer are going to be right there. They're kind of um, not afraid of humans, really, you know. But uh, I think one of the things that, that was the problem there, and Bob and I have addressed it in this year's brochure, is people were applying for this license not knowing that there was no public land to hunt um, and those types of things. So they put in for a license thinking that there would be somewhere to go and hunt. And a lot of the people just didn't know where to hunt once they realized that it's all private fields and those types of things. So in this year's brochure, this year's big game brochure, Bob and I have addressed that by putting a, a really descriptive um, outline of where these this this unit is or, or where the boundaries are and then we've made sure that we comment on the fact that this is private land and you need to have permission so hopefully that will cut down on the number of people just putting in for a license because they want to hunt a doe and we'll get people that have permission and want to go out and harvest one within that boundary and <clears throat> just to add to that also I, I, I would imagine some of you are, are looking at my math saying, well, if you had 75 licenses and you killed 10 does, that doesn't make 30, 34, 44%. So the number of licenses that we have are set. There's 75 licenses that are available. Of that, of, from 2020 last year, or 21, I'm sorry, there were um, 73 licenses that were actually sold or you know, actually purchased. Of that, only a portion of those actually were um, surveyed that, that hunted. And so that's where not, not all 75 licenses are out in the field at one time hunting. And so that's where that comes from a little bit. It'd be no different than if I purchase a license and I don't have time to hunt, 
then you know that lice I'm obviously not harvesting a, an animal and so when that survey goes out they'll call and talk to the sportsman or woman that had the license and ask if they actually made it out to hunt obviously sometimes things happen and, and you don't make it out so that's where some of those percentages come in just for clarification on that uh, oh sorry go ahead I'm no sorry. that's a, I just have a quick question because I might have missed that um, on the applications in that or the does and it says the private land and everything on there I know I know that never mind I'm gonna go blank here for a second I'm gonna get back to you because it's gonna <laughs> pop back to me and I apologize. <laughs> sure. one thing that I would like to um, bring up to to the council is is this is just one tool that we're trying to use to to control this deer population everybody sitting in this room knows how many deer we have and and so I wanted to bring up to you in addition to these licenses that we have issued for hunting we also have issued some damage licenses to um, those farmers ranchers whatever you want to refer to them as that have alfalfa fields and things like that we've given licenses uh, to some of those individuals that have larger tracts of, of ground that are are having damage to their growing c crops from these deer so so we are getting a harvest on some of those things in addition to that uh, you know Bob and I probably put down in a real um, conservative estimate probably um, have to euthanize a uh, hundred deer a year within the city limits of Canyon City or with let me rephrase that within that geographical boundary that we set up to have this hunt and those are animals that have been hit by cars um, stuck in fences you know those types of things so when you think about it we're probably getting a harvest on 150 deer a year and I don't know about you guys but I don't notice 150 deer missing it's there there are that many deer in this in this town so there are some other things that are happening there there's a lot of deer that get hit by cars that we don't know about that that go somewhere and and um, expire from their injuries and stuff so they're we're just talking about the number of deer that we know are are harvested or have died there's there's other deer and when you put all that together and you still see this huge population that says that we've maybe got a little bit of a of an issue there any Questions, comments from council? Yes, Brian. Brandon. So that being said, are are we looking at maybe increasing that number from 75, or why why is the 75 such a targeted number? I don't know that it's a targeted number. What we wanted was a number that wasn't um, that if we wanted to add to it would be easier to add to it than than take away from it. And so the first year was kind of a okay, let's kind of see where we're at with it, and then we started seeing. How many people were actually applying for the license so last year is the uh, is the most number of people that we had apply for it so of the 75 136 applied for it so um, we have what it's called a preference point system that if you apply for a license and don't get it the following year then you have a preference point for it so for residents that applied for it it generally didn't take a preference point now out of state um, resident or out-of-state hunters that applied for it would take two preference points to draw it so we're, we want to keep it where people put in for it especially if if, if I'm a, a landowner and I have five acres or whatever and I wanted to be able to harvest a doe on my on my five acres and I could put in for this license I should be able to to draw that license so it's not really a, a to answer your question it's not a like a scientific number or anything it's what Zach and I sat down and, and talked about and discussed and said we don't want to put you know 200 licenses there because then if everybody went out hunting on the same day then we'd have you know 200 mm -hmm. hunters running around in, in in this geographic area so that's where we came up with that thank you You're I welcome. was just wondering yeah Amy Thanks so much, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, thanks so much for the presentation and all of the, the background information and for clarifying all of the statistics. Um, you bet. Really appreciate all of the numbers. It really helps. I guess I'm wondering, do we know how many deer need to be harvested in order to make this program be more effective? I mean, I know you've tried 75. It sounds like for a number of years now. So 
do you have a, yeah. a target in mind combining this tool with the, the other two that you mentioned? So l let me tell you, I'll put it this way. Um, Officer Croce and I have, uh, we've got a new supervisor. His name's Sean Shepard. He wasn't able to be here tonight. But we talked to Sean about being here to, to present to you guys and, and um, what we were going to talk about. And one of the things that Sean said that he's willing to do and, and that we're willing to do is we don't know how many deer we've got in this geographic boundary. We, we don't. I couldn't, I, I could estimate something. I could probably come up with something off the top of our head, but we don't do that. We base all of our comments on biological facts, you know. So, um, for us to really give you a really good answer to that, we would have to know how many deer we have. Um, we're willing to do that if we need to, um, but those, those would all be, you guys would be kind of the catalyst for that kind of stuff. If, if we want to continue with what we're doing here, if, if you would like to expand on, on our efforts and stuff, that will be something that, that um, we will kind of act as your agent or, or we can, do some of these things on your behalf and, and help you understand what we've what we've got for a population. But I, I think Bob and I don't really know. We could come up with a, a number, but I don't think it'd be, you know, uh, biologically fact-based stuff. Thank you so much for your yep. candor in that. I think, yeah, in order to know um, whether or not the program is effective, obviously one side of it is we haven't had any complaints about anything that's going on in city limits, which is wonderful. Um, but I guess having that other piece of the, the puzzle in terms of what the longer term goal is and what are the measures that we're using to know whether or not it is effective in terms of getting the deer population numbers to be about where they should be so that we aren't having um, some of the, the challenges that we have both as people living in a city but also I'm assuming that there are issues um, that it causes for the deer as well being, being so overpopulated. A absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So there are. from my perspective, at least, I think having more information and more uh, more of the biological facts um, so that we're able to better understand where we're hoping that this program actually gets us within the next couple of years would be really welcomed. We, we actually have um, part of a on the north side of the river and, and I think on the south side the last couple of years, we have what's called a survival migration study. And so we put radio collars and telemetry collars on does and fawns and generally we kind of stayed out of city limits and stuff like that because you know it wasn't really part of the study but the last few years we actually have been putting a few radio collars on on some does and fawns just to see where those animals are going if they are migrating out or if they're sticking around and then part of the study is to see where they go and then the other part is a survival if if that animal dies, what actually happened to it? If it was hit by a car, if it was harvested, if it was a predation or something like that. So we started um, putting a few collars in and around town, a lot of it on in North Canyon and stuff, kind of right um, by Macomb Lumber and stuff like that, right at that transition stage. And so what we're seeing is that um, basically the the does that we, we collar pretty much stick, stick around the town they they don't really go too far we did have one that kind of made its way up by um, the Broadmoor and then worked its way back but um, and then the survival what was usually killing most of them um, were, were vehicles is what we found were were killing most of, of the deer so that's something that we're, we're also tying into or, or tied into that study there to kind of see where the deer in town were going but then also it's, it's a little more challenging just because towards the end of October, middle of, of November, we see a, an increase of, of bucks coming into town. Um, it's not a big secret. There's a lot of folks around that you know keep tabs on some of the, the bigger bucks in town and have them named and have pictures of them from three years ago while they're in velvet and when they get hard antlers and stuff like that. And every year, I get a call they're like hey did you see this deer you know I haven't seen it all summer and it just shows up and that's the rut is starting and so those bucks are coming down because we do have you know a pretty good number of, of does in town especially around um, by the uh, fire department off of uh, central or not central the next one Harding Harding up that way and stuff like that and then Zach sees it 
over on his stuff off of Elm Street and over there by the cemetery and stuff where we have bigger tracts of open land and stuff. So um, that's, that's kind of the challenge I think is trying to get a, a population estimate for this area. The deer are taken into consideration when we do the overall population estimate for, for the whole DMU, which runs from basically Leadville to Phantom Canyon. That's where the whole, that takes in the whole side on the north side of the river. And so that those numbers are taken in, but it's not that we don't break them out into just this part for, for Canyon. So that's kind of the challenge, but that's why we wanted to put some of those collars on the deer in town just to see them. Um, Zach and I put some out probably six or seven years ago, and we actually had to recollar a, a doe because somebody was thinking that the collar was too tight. And so we recollared her. It wasn't that it was too tight at all. It's just that she was, um, you know, changing. The seasons were changing, so she's kind of gruffy. And we pulled the collar off of her. And the collar, the collars last about three, three to four years. And this collar was was dead. And and it was, I think that. Zach and I collared her back in 2015, I think. So, you know, she was doing doing pretty good, still still running around. So we put another collar on her. The collars on the does stay on for the life of them; they don't come off. The fawn collars drop off in about six months or so. So that's how we'll see if they make it from six months to to one year. Tim, I'm gonna have a couple things here. <laughs> Because, as, as Zach knows, uh, we've had some deer problems in our yard. Um, I, you know, I live off of uh, Baldwin. My backyard has a hay field, and then there's probably, what, 12 to 15 acres of hay right behind me. Mm -hmm. But we're all small plotted, so we don't have enough land to get tags. Every hay person back there is, is frustrated with this situation. Mm -hmm. um, I had an incident, and, and you know, Zach came over. Uh, my son was out with his dog and the deer attacked, you know, the deer attacked our dog and it was a big chest peak, but they put him down and, you know, here's my little boy out there with him. And that's a scary thought for me. And, you know, my boy's only seven, even, I, I know what deer can do. I mean, there's no doubt. Um, but that's a tough situation. I got a little boy out there playing with his dog and deer come after him. They weren't necessarily going after my son, but they, they got our dog and, yep. but I think one of the frustrating factors, and, and I, it's just, you know, and I know you're giving out permits to big landowners. I, I, I know if they have X amount of acres or bigger, but I think we need to, or maybe you guys can look at this, because Lincoln Park and that, and a lot of Canyon is filled with two, three acre, four acre, you know, five acres. And I think you, the limit is, I can't remember what the minimum land requires. No, 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 no. For for what you guys give out for your extra permits, for damage control. So there's not necessarily a, a limit on on acreage, but <clears throat> what we have to be able to justify is that the reason we're giving those tags out is for damage. game damage. Right. So I, under, I understand that. I mean, I, I I completely understand your concern, and and believe me, you're not the only one that that right. has that concern. But you know, having somebody that has that makes their living off of their hay field opposed to somebody that's cutting hay for their horses or or for the winter or something is is different. And so Zach and I have to be able to justify to not only the our supervisor, our game damage of, of why we're giving out out those <coughs> tags for, for that per parcel of land. I, I don't mean to sound controversial here at all. Please don't take it this way. A lot of the people I know who get vouchers they're not making the living off their land. They're making extra money off their land. They all have jobs. I'm not talking down at the Colon Orchards area. Let's eliminate them. Yeah. I know that. But the other ones that I know have gotten tags, they all have very, very high paying jobs. And they're well, making their living. And I don't mean that, I'm not saying that controversial at all. But I think it's just something that we need to look at and just in perspective. Because like I said, in my area, my wife and I went out and counted within three blocks of our house. We went down South 12th to Garfield between Park and Sherman. We counted 114 deer. We didn't count them all because I can't see everywhere, but we counted 114 deer. You know, we have 30 deer in our, in that, in that 30 to 40 deer in that hay fields right now behind 
and right between, you know where I live, on Baldwin and, and Sherman. All those hay fields there, they're daily. <laughs> I don't mind them that much. My wife can't stand them. <laughs> but it, it, it makes a problem, and, and unfortunately, I get a lot of calls. I'm that, I'm that person up there, and that, you know, that's my district. Yeah. Um, and, it, and as you know, I'm a hunter as well. And, you know, I have no problem with it. I have no problem with people hunting. I've offered my land before. I've talked with, with Mr. Holder just saying, hey, if anybody wants to come and hunt my ground, please give them my number, anything, tell them. Because that's how bad everybody in my area will let anybody on. And I think that's maybe something that we can do maybe as a city and saying, hey, anybody got hay fields that you can volunteer on? Uh, you know, just... 75 is a nice number, but we're normally taking 15 of them. You and I both know that's not doing anything for our population. Yeah. Uh, let, let me address that a little bit. Um, okay. At least in my district, and I will not speak for Bob, I, I, I know that's the same way in Bob's district, but I'll speak about mine. When I give licenses out, dispersal tags out, it is to people that are legitimately suffering what we call game damage, all right? And they are people that I know maybe are not making a living off of it, but are um, using it for a, a, a solid supplemental income, all right? And whether a, a lot of people are supplementing their income with second jobs, um, Brandon stays an hour longer so he can take two more clients and stuff. So. This, this hay for some of these people is, is critically important to their existence. Um, some of them run businesses. I, I'll, I'll use the pumpkin patch, for example. We give licenses to keep damage from happening in those places. The places that I have, giving, have given dispersal tags are, number one, bigger tracts of land. Number two, they are places where people are suffering damage and they are using those crops, whether it's pumpkins, whether it's alfalfa or whatever, to supplement their income. And then third, and probably should have been number one, and most importantly, it's in a place that's got a large enough tract of land where we can address that population safely. I'm not going to do something if I can't address it in a safe manner. So we've got those things going. Bob gives has the same thing at, at the Abbey and places like that. So these are places where people are suffering damage that use that crop for a supplemental income, maybe not their primary income, but they are using it as a supplemental income. And, and so that's what meets the requirements. We, when there is damage to growing crops like that, that's when, that's when we can start looking at that. So, um, just, one, one, just, one, oh, I'm oh, sorry, go, go ahead, no. sorry. Just real quick, just to follow up, uh, and I'm not being controversial, I'm just kind of, just, wouldn't you say that everybody who even has a two or three acre hay field is supplementing? Because it's, it's costing them. That hay is not cheap to, it's not cheap to grow, water shares. It is not cheap to have our hay cut and then to sell it. It's a supplemental income. I think, uh, Tim, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I think that that would be a conversation that we would uh, maybe have, you know, just you and I or, or whatever. I, I, I don't want to open Pandora's box here. I don't, want to, I, I don't want to go down an avenue where every little place, what, no. what, what we're doing is we have um, within statute certain requirements that, that we use to say, is this an agricultural product? Is it, is it being used for income and all of those different things? So I think, I think that those are all things that we can have conversations about as we move forward with, with these processes, honestly. Okay. Uh, Amy, and then <clears throat> we probably need to allow some public comment here, but Amy. No, no, no. Uh, I have one. I pressed your button. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I skipped you. <laughs> Madam Mayor. <laughs> okay. So I do have some questions as well. And Kennedy has been the news this last week about the, the problem with homelessness. So it's kind of in the radar. But I'm going to have to say in the last two years, I have by far and above beyond any other issue probably have had more complaints about the deer population than anything else. You and I both. Uh -huh. Bob and I, yeah. 
You bet. And so <laughs> I guess my question is that kind of similar to Dennehy's is what, what more can we do to address our urban deer population? Like I'm totally for getting those counts. We can see if it's effective, if we need to make more tags. Are there other solutions that we can approach or, and combine? <clears throat> Yeah, go up, go up. Well, I think that, you know, as, as an agency, um, we have to be careful of what we, what we do because, you know, if we say that, you know, you want us to go out and, and call deer, which is basically go out and, you know, euthanize deer and have somebody to donate them to or something like that, then that sets a precedent for every other little small town in Colorado that has the same issue with deer, not just Canyon City, because it's not isolated to Canyon City. It's Canyon City, it's Slida, it's Buena Vista, it's every little, it, you know, it's Colorado Springs has a large population of deer. And so as an agency, we're not going to, you know, try to set a precedent, you know, and, and, and do something that, that can't be done throughout the state. So um, we are open to, you know, looking outside the box, so to speak, and, and trying to come up with some other ideas um, one thing that we, we won't do is we're not going to trap and relocate deer out of town because of disease issues and stuff like that. And then also cost effectiveness of that. We've also found that when you relocate deer, they, they don't have a very high success rate. They don't have a high survival rate. So stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I know there's been some, some questions about, you know, darting with drugs and stuff like that, but that's not something that that we do, plus it's also extremely expensive to do that, and you know we don't have the the funding, and we're like I say, it's not something that we as an agency I don't think would would look at doing stuff like that. But you know, as far as trying to come up with some some other ideas, I have no problem with that, or or, or working with some folks to try to come up with some ideas on stuff, and I know that we get a lot of complaints about um, the deer, but we also, for every two complaints, we have you know, one that they, they love the deer, that's the best thing that they've ever ever seen to the point that it's almost illegal what they're setting out for squirrels that you know, is considered you know, feeding birds and stuff like that, so. Well, that kind of leads me to another question that some people have recommended <laughs> some ordinances against feeding animals in town. Well, that, that's, that, that's a state statute. Yes. You, you can't do that. That's illegal. And, and, and can be very, very detrimental to the health of the animal. I mean, you've got disease issues. Um, <laughs> people that set out corn and things like that, it creates um, terrible abscesses in their stomachs. And, and it's, it's really doing the deer a major injustice. I, I know that they're trying to help and that they, that they love these animals or and we love them too, but that feeding is, it's illegal and it is detrimental to the health of the animal. So if you are euthanizing about 100 deer a year because they're getting caught in fences or hit by cars, which is very dangerous, um, I mean obviously it kills the deer, but it's dangerous to our human beings and their cars too. <laughs> At what point is there a time where you maybe need to make that call of maybe it is time to euthanize? deer and harvest I mean in some ways that I don't know I don't know what that point would be but I know that that would be at a level above mine and and officer holders I know that you know him and I aren't just going to sit there and say okay let's go right. you know, and and call some deer um, that's that's really not going to happen I mean we could speak with our supervisor and it'll have to go to a, a regional manager and on up from there but I don't know if if that's something that the the city would support then I'm not saying that it can happen I'm just saying there's going to be some some legwork that we would have to do both on our end and yours as well to make sure that that's something that you know everybody could sit here and say yes that's what we we want to do because it's I have hunted my whole life and I, I love hunting. There's a big difference between hunting and, you know, just putting down animals. It's not, it's not all that fun. 
Mm -hmm. Sure. No, and, and part of my question is that it's out there for the public to hear and some right. public comment. So we have an understanding of what can and cannot be done. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. oh, sorry. Repeat question Can we increase the licenses so more than just 15 get harvested a year? Not, not this year. <laughs> We've already set the license numbers. So it's going to be at 75. I think this addition of the of a better description on what this hunt is to the brochure i think we might see more success right there uh so we'll we'll let that play out but we have already set the license numbers for the 2022 big game season we can revisit that next year and and see what we do and and we'll have those harvest statistics and and we can go from there um one thing to kind of go back to your question to Officer Croce is, uh, like I say, I, I talked to my supervisor um, before I came here, and, and Sean is, is very forward thinking. He's, uh, he's, he's very good at, at working through problems, and, and I know that if that is a direction that you want to go or even want to talk about it, that, that Sean and, and our leadership would be more than happy to to have meetings. I don't. I'm sorry if I'm naive to the processes of when you can have work meetings and all of that stuff uh, as it pertains to um, public information. But I know that that our supervisor is certainly interested in talking about alternatives to this problem because there are other things that we're not thinking about here that are, are coming up and and you know you're lucky because you've got bob bob grew up here he's been the game warden here for 20 years almost uh, or have been haven't you so he's very intimate in the knowledge of what this town was what the deer population was where it's at now and where it could go but but i i, I know in the 14 years that i've been here i've seen an increase in the number of um, mountain lion sightings in town and those types of things so there's there's some other things here that that are are happening you you put you put ice cream in the middle of the desert and people are going to go and get that ice cream you, you've got you've got predators now that are coming into a forage base mountain lions eat deer so we're starting to see more and more uh, mountain lion sightings on the fringes and more towards the more towards town now uh, you, you know uh, Park Street and, and Sherman and those places and so there's there's a bunch of things to think about here and and that's one of those one of those things so is it the, oh, go ahead. I just saying um, you had mentioned that sometimes people have been getting deer tags not realizing it needed to be private property and maybe didn't know where to go to get permission is it possible to help connect property owners who really want to have someone Absolutely. Harvest on their deer to yep. those interested to those. Yeah, tags. and we've we've got that list. I mean, I, I've got those people written down. I know Bob does too. We we will be the we will promote that. We will connect those people. We'll be the catalyst there, we, we, because we want harvest. I mean, that's that's the reason why we put those licenses out there is we'd like to get that harvest. Um, and and for the people listening. When we put those animals down, um, Bob and I, in, in, in every single case that we can, we try to donate that meat. So if that deer is in good shape, um, you know, the meat is still good, we try to donate that to a member of the community that needs meat and, and not see that animal go to waste. Sometimes it's not feasible. Sometimes they've got infections um, that, that we don't want to risk anything giving that to an individual and maybe making them sick maybe they've been hit by a car and that meat could be so bloodshot and stuff that it's just not fit for human consumption but i want it to be known in in this public forum that that we try to donate edible portions of those those deer that we put down uh, in in every circumstance thank you for that um the we're we're going to need to cut this off here pretty quick I'm going to make just a quick comment and then call on Emily Tracy. Um, but as wildlife experts, if we're, if our total um, cull is, you know, 150 or so deer, can you back calculate what the, what the population has to be so that it's not declining? Okay. And the other way to ask that question is, 
if you, if you know the size of the population, do you know the number of deer that you have to cull per year? Uh, any, you don't, this is this, uh, just a rhetorical question right now. Do you know the number of deer that we would have to cull per year to start reducing that population? Uh, and I'm going to turn now to Emily, please. Thanks. Uh, my question was partly in line with what the mayor asked a few minutes ago, just what alternatives there might be. And I guess I'll just make a quick comment. And that is, if there's ever an experimental sterilization program, I would guess that for, for the deer, for the deer, I would guess that our community would be interested in hearing more about something like that. That's all. We might have community members that are interested in that for different reasons. <laughs> Not going there. <laughs> uh, Tim, I think Amy. I just have oh, I just had one more thing to say. I want I want to thank you guys and Sorry. and as me being a landowner and I know back there and I and I've talked with Bob about this. If there's anything that we can do to help facilitate that of of helping the hunters who draw the tags to get out on land, I mean. My land is wide open. I, I will welcome every one of them. Now, I don't put in for that anymore because, like you said, you want to go out on a hunt, you and I both know, is that a hunt? No, it's, it's not a hunt. It's a, it's a shooting. It's just going out and harvesting a deer. Doing, but it's, it's a thing that needs to be done. But I, I think if, you know, if we can get some other people to, and just work with the landowners and maybe get a list for you guys and say, hey, have, have, you, have, you guys have the 75 names of the people who draw. Put it out there. Let's let's see if we can let's see if we can get them together. Because, you know, I've said this, and, and not once has anybody ever come to our neck of the woods. And I mean, I guarantee they come. They'll shoot one just like that. It's not an issue. It's not yeah. a matter. Am I going to get one? You're going to get one unless you miss. But you know, I would like to help that too. Just whatever we can do to help facilitate that to to, you know, to help this process. I, I agree 100%, and I think the only thing that we're missing there just <laughs> some of the logistics for it because as if, if Zach and I are a liaison between the hunter and the property owner, we need to be very careful that I'm not giving a landowner's information out to a person that he doesn't want on there. You know, we have hunters calling saying, hey, can you give me the name of the landowners? And I'm like, unless that landowner has given me permission to give them that, information i just can't give out a landowner's information to to a hunter and say yes go ask him to hunt but unless we have that prior to and and like officer holder said we have some folks that say hey if you need somebody to hunt or need to let somebody on to hunt let me know and i can see what they do generally the landowners that we deal with are very open especially for youth hunters you know a, a younger hunter that's just starting out I'm not saying this is an ideal situation for that, but we have had a lot of youth hunters um, come out and harvest animals with this this hunt in and around town. So that also makes a big difference. Is is that written permission or just verbal? Just permission? verbal permission. Okay, all right. Yes. Thank you, mm, Amy. I just had one question along those lines as well. Um, when you're determining who gets permits in future years, do you are you able to take into account whether they pulled a permit and then did not hunt in past years? Because it seems like from the numbers, there are a lot of people who pull permits and then don't actually use them. Yeah, no, mm -mm. No. no. It's you you put in for a license. Um, essentially, you go into the draw system as a number. You've got a number, and it's it's. It's a random deal um, without getting into preference points and things like that, but it's, yeah, no, that's, that's tough to do. I, I think one thing that also, it's a, it's a 75 number, but that number can increase because that's also in unit 581-69. Correct. And if somebody has, draws one of those tags for public land, if they have permission to go on private ground and the land's big enough, then they can also go in and harvest a deer on that property. So Correct. we're saying 75 tags. I'm just kind of saying this for, it's 75 tags, but believe me, that number is, there's a lot of people in town who draw the tag and shoot one on their property, and that's not even counted on the 75 tags. Mm -hmm. Correct. Sure, it just seems like based on the numbers that you shared, there are, you know, of, there are uh, twice as many people who want a tag as there are tags available. And then of the people who are getting tags, only about half of them are actually even hunting. So it seems like there's, I'm really hopeful that your ad and the way that you're framing it in, right. in the, um, in your publications this year will really cut down on that issue. Thanks. I hope, we, we hope, hope so, so too. 
Hang on just a second. Brandon, is um, Brian Cooper here? Council, uh, I've been here before and in that, and I toyed with this idea. I saw what the Division of Wildlife did to try to stop the migration of white-tailed deer up the Arkansas. And it did a lot of good, although we still have white tails around, but it did decrease the number quite a bit. But it was a large number of licenses. So I thought, why don't we have this license be a Class C license, over-the-counter, unlimited? And then I thought, yes, they, they have a point here. It's going to be pretty hard to manage. But maybe we have to do them in a, in a uh, like a smaller periods, like five-day periods each, and divide them up and, and divide it out. But then I got to thinking, what the heck? I used to have to buy, in fact, I still do, have to buy a license if I want to trap uh, raccoons, as an example, or red foxes. Or anything like that, I have to buy a small game or a fur taker's license. And that, so that got me looking at the nuisance wildlife laws in Colorado. It seems to me that we have wild deer that we all like to hunt. But we have now here, we have what I'll call residential deer, for lack of a better word. And it's not a hunt. So there's not going to be that many people that want to even bring their son as a youth or a daughter and, and show this off as being a hunting uh, endeavor, because it's not. So really, we have to sort of look at the classification. So raccoons, red foxes, and that can be classified as a nuisance animal. And there's quite a list here, but there's no, no deer. I mean, cottontails, porcupines. Tree squirrels, all this kind of stuff, can be classified as a nuisance animal. And I think we may have to be, maybe this city, take the step. They mentioned Colorado Springs. They mentioned Salida. I can also mention Fort Collins. Other places where the Division of Wildlife is kicking this can around. And they haven't found a solution. So. They've been kicking the can. Right now, I'll guarantee there are probably our deer herd is well over 600 in this area. And harvesting 15, well, that won't even count the fawns down 12th Street. So we're not being, it's not being managed correctly. I looked at divisional, well, I hunt. Both of these guys know me. And so I was in there looking in the 2022 brochure and I saw what they had there. And I went back and I looked and I pulled up the old records from 2021, that's the most current that they have, and saw that it was just 75 licenses granted. Now, the problem is there's only like 108 people applied for them. And you say, why? Well, that's because it's not really a hunt. And most hunters want to go on a hunt. And they'd like to go someplace where they can do that. So I brings it back. What can we do if we classify residential deer as a nuisance animal? How do we get that happen? And that has to happen through the Colorado Division of Parks and Wildlife in their regulations. But I think it's something that we should really, really consider because uh, you mentioned your dog. I worry about my dog. That's why I'm also on the fence thing, trying to keep deer out. And that my neighbor here just yesterday is trying to grow some grass, and four does went right through their yard. So now the nice ground that they'd prepared and seeded and everything has potholes in it all over. So that's something they're going to have to deal with once their grass comes up. But the thing is, we have ticks. We have disease that affects the animals where veterinarians are having us 
vaccinate our animals. Something really needs to be done. And I, I, I like these two guys, and I know both their parents <laughs> and in that. So, you know, I, I think they, but the problem is the Division of Wildlife needs a little bit of a kick in the butt. There's, let's do something here. And I think maybe classifying deer as a nuisance animal, residential deer, maybe is an avenue that could be looked at. And I'm not an attorney, but I think maybe the city attorney might want to take a look at that and see if there's a way to do it. And uh, I know all I know is the deer population has exploded, and it's just going to get worse if we don't do something. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Brandon. I just have something brief. Um, if somebody's interested, somebody's watching, um, where can they get a brochure with all this information? Any, any, uh, a brochure as far as the, the big game brochure, is that what you're talking well, about? Well, just the brochure you guys were talking about that you Okay, yeah, you yeah. So the, the big game brochure, it's got information about deer, elk, antelope, uh, season dates, all of that stuff. You can get one of those brochures, obviously online, everything's online now. But anywhere where you can buy a hunting or fishing license in the state, you can pick one of those up. Walmart, Big R, Big Five Sports, those places. So they're free. You go in, grab one, and go out with them. Awesome. And like I said, I just wanted, for the yep. people watching, if they don't know where to get right. one, I just wanted to give them a little advertisement on Correct. where they could grab one. So thank you, gentlemen, for being here. I don't think we've solved the problem tonight. We've certainly talked about it. It's going to take some more talking and some process, I think, right. for us to, uh, to perhaps achieve our, from our perspective, our goals up here. Uh, and that may involve um, escalation, you know, trying to talk to your boss, trying to talk to your boss's boss or something like that. Uh, and it's, that's not a reflection on you guys, but it's just a reflection of the realities of the process sometimes Correct. that we have to use to, to affect change. Yes, absolutely. Thank we, you. We appreciate the opportunity Thank to come you for and speak having to you guys. Tonight. Thank you. Guys, have a good night. Thank you. Okay. And we've got about five minutes to hear about fences. Fast. <laughs> is, is, am I up, Mr. Mayor, for Tim? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, five minutes. Um, that will be tough for me. I'll see what I can do. Uh, so, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, Madam Mayor, members of the council, good afternoon. Uh, I was asked to prepare a summary about the city's fence regulations. Uh, they, what we have dates back in its origin to sometime in the 1990s. With our most recent code update, what we really did do it was simplify front yard fence standards. Right now, the way the code is written, in your side or backyard, it's essentially behind the front plane of the house you can have a fence that's a maximum of six feet in height. In the front yard, prior to the adoption of the UDC, fence height in front yards was, there, there were two parameters. If it was less than 50% visually transparent, you were limited to 30 inches in height. If it was more than 50% visually transparent, you're, you were limited to four feet in height, 48 inches. We simplified that with the new code uh, and just made everything across the board in front yards 48 inches. The primary reason for the fence height in front yards has to do with site visibility triangles. If you come up to a stop sign in a residential neighborhood and the cross street is not stop sign limited, you need to be able to have clear visibility down the street in both directions to determine oncoming traffic as to whether or not you can then proceed forward. If you've got fences that are higher than five feet, in fact, or four feet, in fact, not just fences, but in some cases, shrubs and plant materials, you will be blocking that visibility. And what happens is people have to then creep actually into the intersection to get a clear view down the streets. This is why we created that, that height limit. The, the, um, the rationale between, be, behind the six foot height limit for uh, backyard fences has to do with the fact that it is human scale, average human height, is just a little under six feet. So it is a relatable height. The minute you go above that height, you change that scale relationship and the space feels very different. Um, so th those are the rationals behind why we have the fence height that we do. 
I should note that we do have a variety of fence materials that people can make fences out of. And in fact, in the next omnibus uh, batch of, ord of the, the omnibus ordinance that we'll be bringing to you after having some conversations with Councilmember Schmisher, we will be introducing barbed wire as a fence material, but only in RL rural living uh, zone districts with acreage lots for people who have active uh, agricultural applications going on. So with that in place, um, I guess I'm open to any questions that you may have. Did I did I use up my five minutes? The, uh, thank you for that, for, for being brief. We've got a couple of minutes here uh, because we do need to take a break between this meeting and the next one. But um, any questions or comments by council? Um, I have one. Sure. Um, Patrick, um, I know we have some citizens here that would like to see higher fences in their backyards so they can, for their landscaping needs. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, do you see a possibility where we could have a six foot privacy for the fence, but then above that it could be higher with something that was more transparent so it wouldn't change the feel as much? Well, I, I suppose we could look at that. I guess the question I'd have to ask is what are we talking about as an application on top of that fence? Are we talking about concertina wire? Are we talking about barbed wire? Um, I, I'm still worried about the aesthetic impact something like that would do to the neighborhoods. And I'm even more worried about the fact that if we make a change like this and people begin using that for new fencing that they put up in their neighborhoods and the city determines you don't like it, putting that particular genie back in the bottle is not going to be an easy task. Well, I mean, we could we can make that standard <laughs> of what those materials could or could not be. And so if it was like a 50% transparency, essentially what you're saying is that it would uh, be a visually different than, than the you know, complete fi privacy fence. Yeah, I mean, there are some wiring that is still pretty classy looking that, or- um, Lattice. Lattice or um, wrought iron or just different things that if somebody really wanted to have that eight foot, they could accomplish it in a nice way. And this is, and, and the, and for you think the reason would be for for um, deer control is or it that just... that's the motivation i mean this is okay. why this gentleman right here has been coming to city council okay um i'm gonna go ahead and call on colleen and then i'll get to you amy please hi my name is colleen uh, norholm and i live at 1012 south 12th street and I mistakenly put up a six foot fence in my front yard, but it was very beautiful. And my neighbors all gave me the thumbs up on it. They were very happy with it and thought it really improved the, the, the neighborhood. It, 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 it um, uh, replaced uh, a, a four foot chain link. And um, I wasn't aware that there was a you know, such, such requirements in replacing, um, you know, a fence. Anyway, um, the reason why I went with a six foot fence was because of the deer and also because I have 11 grandchildren and they're pedophiles, as everyone knows, all over and they can easily reach over a four foot fence. And um, the, the, as far as line of sight, um, it was, it, I have to go just as far, far forward now as I did at that time. And I installed that fence six inches um, behind where the other one had been. So it was further back from the road. And I have to stop in exactly the same place, or I did when the fence was up, um, to see you know, uh, if there were any cars coming. It was 80% open, so you could see through. It had two gates, a drive-through gate on the far end, and then a four-foot gate in the middle. And, uh, you know, it really made my property look very nice, and uh, I spent a lot of money on it. But the city uh, required that I uh, take it down or they were going to bring me to court. And when I asked if it was possible to get a variance, they said there was no possibility. And I'm just wondering why. And did, did you apply for a permit before you put up the fence? N no. And I went in to, um, to try to, um, you know, uh, 
do whatever I needed to do to make that, you know, to, uh, if I had to pay uh, a penalty, I didn't care. I just didn't know that I needed one to replace an existing fence. So um, anyway, but I was told, no, I, you have to take it down or we're going to bring you to court. And it was kind of a hard line, I thought. Um, and then I found out just recently that they might let me put it up 25 feet back, but I lose over 3,000 square feet of my yard if I do that. That's a lot of yard that I pay taxes on. And I don't see why, you know, in such a beautiful fence, you know, and, and I, you know, why it can't be a standard for fences all over the city. And it would help keep the deer out, help, um, you know, uh, it, would, it would limit their feeding area so it would force them out of town. Thank you for those, thank you for those comments. The, uh, you know, right now what, what we're doing is, the, uh, this is kind of a, uh, instructional session for us. We're not really set up to uh, act in a, any type of judicial role. Mm -hmm. uh, what you do need to do is work work with with our zoning administrator, um, Patrick Mulready, and our city administrator, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know see if you can get some resolution that way. Mm -hmm. um, but but there's there's not much that we can do other than listen and understand your problem and. Mm -hmm see if there's some general solution that we can mm -hmm. apply. I do mm -hmm. have a question. The piece of paper you were holding up earlier, is yep. that from a, did you hire somebody to build your fence? My son and my grandson okay. helped me. I was just asking, it looked like a receipt from an agency. And no. most I of the time from those agencies do pull permits. So yeah, that's why I was asking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. Amy? We always have to do, oh, go ahead, sorry. sorry. Amy? I, um, I was just going to, to mention that I think a lot of great and really hard work went into the UDC um, and into all of the changes um, that, that took place last year. But I do think that we all recognized and realized that when that was happening, um, you know, it was a company from Chicago and, and sometimes uh, even through that process we had to be like, no, no, tr gravel driveways are okay here. No, no, like some things are different in Chicago than they are in rural Colorado. So I just, I'm really glad that we're having this conversation because I think that there are a lot of things kind of throughout the UDC as we're applying it that we're finding out maybe do need some tweaks here and there. So I'm just, I'm glad that, that we're starting that conversation and starting that process. So I'll, I'll limit my remarks to that because I know that we're, we're already up into the next meeting. I think um, part of that though, I, I mean, I, I can see some conversation for backyards, especially if the next two feet we're maybe 80% 80, 80 transparent with certain standards. I feel really uncomfortable having eight foot fences throughout the entire city of Canyon City in the front yard. The implications of what that can mean to our city, uh, that's, a pretty big, that's a pretty big move. I think we need to be careful about. Right now though, it's four foot in the front yard. And mm -hmm. um, I think uh, what, what um, and I'm so sorry, I did yeah. not catch Colleen. the last year. Colleen, Colleen. Yeah. Uh, Normal. What Ms. Colleen mentioned was that her fence in the front yard was, had a great deal of opacity and again, not acting in a judicial manner at all. But I do think there's, there's a, some room between four feet and eight feet and there's some room is, between is totally feet? opaque. No, it was six feet. Six, six, six feet, feet. Yeah. yeah. Totally opaque and if you have that kind of transparency where, you know, it's not like uh, you're walking down and you can't see what's going on and it doesn't have that neighborly no. feel. So I just think there's a lot of room for conversation and a lot of conversations that need to be had to make sure yeah. that this really fits for what we're trying yeah. to do and for our realities here in Canyon. Yeah. I have a suggestion too about the hunting and that's that if they required uh, portable um, uh, uh, tree um, um, yeah. stands, yeah, they tree do. stands, that they their line of sight would be better and it would be they, safer. They They'd do be have to be shooting higher. down. And that is one of the rules. Oh, good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and with that, we're going to go ahead and, and close this meeting. I think we're there, already... was, there was one more. Piece yes, of yes, sir. I just say I signed up to be able to talk on it. Oh, um, oh I just I thought it was just on the fencing issue. Oh, no. I mean, oh no, it does say fencing. Yes, please go ahead. I guess I'm a little disappointed. I was told when I went to the council meetings on Monday that that the regulation had to be changed by council. And to come to the government meeting, 
to start this process, you know, to get the, the juices flowing and everything else so people understand. But I'm sort of like Colleen. I'm sitting here, what am I going to do about my fence? You know, a half a block down the street from me in the county, they can put a six-foot fence up that's probably 80%, probably 90% clear space. I want to do the same. Why can't I? And so I don't need, going in for a variance for every property owner to do this, to me, makes no sense. You know, it ought to be in the regulations. We're 2022. You know, 150 years ago, Canyon City got started. And I'm sure they had no fencing regulations at all back then. But the thing is, times change. And the Division of Wildlife very definitely showed us that times are changing. And that, so I would like to see it brought up to council that it be allowed to be a 60, six foot fence, you know, on all around your property if you so wish. And the visibility, if you want to set it at 57%, 62% or whatever through the fence, so be it. <clears throat> but, you know, it's our property. We pay the taxes on it. We'd like to make it nicer and we'd like to keep the deer out because they don't pay any property tax. And so, you know, I just think that I don't want to hear more meetings really on this subject. I think that you're all smart enough. You can think here a little bit and get something done. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Do we need to give some direction um, <laughs> for what's... Patrick to maybe do some research on fencing like that has 80 to 90 percent open space and what those products would be like and what the possibilities could be for Canyon City I mean I wouldn't want to go any and, and so so as I understand it, we're going to be doing an omnibus code reevaluation <laughs> where you're going to be suggesting changes to the code that you where where staff has identified various issues uh, that we have uh, and so I think the ask is to uh, include this in that omnibus um, reevaluation and perhaps present it with some options. Let's have some discussion on it, some public discussion where we can talk where there are sometimes good and sufficient reasons for different rules that the city has, uh, that we can have that uh, discussion and, um, and perhaps move this ball forward. Okay. And, and probably, yes, and, and to the public, government does move frustrating, infuriatingly slow. So my apologies. So we're, we're going to adjourn this meeting. We're already eating into our urban renewal authority time. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.